Welcome to The Word Unveiled, our continuing series of programs about our faith, brought to you by St. Malachy Catholic Church in Sterling Heights, Michigan. St. Malachy is part of the Archdiocese of Detroit, and Father Joseph Gimbala is our pastor. My name is Gordon Peck. Our program is about the Maccabees, and we will delve into part two in a three-part series where we talk about the Hasmonean dynasty. But first, as in all things, let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious and most merciful God, give us ears to hear your words, a mind to comprehend your meaning, and hearts that will allow your word to take root in our lives. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, to, in this part of the program, we're going to talk about how the Maccabean Revolt enters a new phase with the brothers of Judah Maccabee, and we'll talk about the reign of John Hyrcanus, and his sons and grandsons, and then the coming of the Romans and the end of the Hasmonean dynasty. So here's our family tree, if you will. The Maccabean revolt began in 167. Mattathias, the priest, uh, died of natural causes in that year. Uh, his son Eliezer died at the Battle of Beth Zechariah in 162 BC, and Judah Maccabee died at the Battle of Eliasa in 160 BC. And, his, and their brother, Jonathan, has now been chosen to be the leader to pre- replace Judah, and the conflict continues. So we'll talk about the brothers of Judah Maccabee. Well, Jonathan had fought alongside his brother in nearly every battle, but he and Simon and John were able to escape death or capture in the Battle of Eliasa, where Judah was killed. Jonathan was chosen leader by the loyal revolutionaries. and sent by King Demetrius I, a Seleucid general, Bacchides, tried to encircle and capture them. So Jonathan and his followers crossed to the east side of the Jordan River and retreated to the desert. They were in full flight. To escape further harassment from Bacchides, Bacchides, uh, Jonathan instructed his brother John to take the supply wagons into the friendly territory of the Nabataeans. But through an act of treachery, John was killed by a hostile group, and the supplies were lost. The Nabataeans lived in the area that is commonly known today as Petra, is in eastern, uh, western, and southern Jordan. Jonathan went after them, and he avenged his brother's death, and he recovered a considerable amount of the supplies. And subsequent to this, Jonathan crossed the Jordan River and attacked Bekiti's army once again. Well, Jonathan, in his surprise attack, was on the verge of killing the general Bacchides in battle when the latter turned, got away from him, and ran away. But despite the retreat of their leader, the Seleucids had the better of the fight, and Jonathan and his men, who were greatly outnumbered, were forced to swim across the Jordan River in order to preserve their small army. And Bacchides' leaderless army did not follow. And about about the same time, Alcimus, the high priest, installed by Antiochus IV, Epiphanes died. Bacchides, frustrated and exhausted by this unending conflict, soon left for Syria. He'd had enough of this uh, uh, activity in Judea. So after the departure of Bacchides, Jonathan made great strides in the struggle against the Hellenistic Jews. Two years after the departure of Bacchides, the Greeks in the Acre felt sufficiently threatened to call for his return. The Acre was that little fortress in the middle of Jerusalem that Greek soldiers stayed in. Well, Jonathan avoided direct conflict, and he resorted to guerrilla raids, just as his brother Judah had done years earlier. And Bacchides became frustrated with this stalemate, and he became critical of the Hellenistic Jews, that is, those Jews who were cooperating with the Seleucids, and he ultimately killed 50 of their leadership before he abandoned them. I guess he's trying to get on their good side. Well, Jonathan perceived that Bacchides regretted having returned to this conflict, and so he offered a a truce and an exchange of prisoners. And Bacchides, who was fed up with this whole thing, readily accepted, and he further added an oath that he would never make war on Jonathan again. And then he and his army promptly left Judea. Well, Jonathan was now in control of a large part of the countryside, and he used this time to pursue and subdue the Hellenists, that is, the Hellenistic Jews, who he fundamentally opposed. Well, 
external events now suddenly favored the Maccabees. The king of the Seleucids, Demetrius I Soter, his relations with his fellow kings in Asia Minor and Egypt were strained, and those and these others supported a rival claimant to his throne. So he's facing a rebellion within his own empire. And they put out a rival claimant named Alexander Ballas. He was supposedly another son of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, and therefore a cousin to Demetrius. Well, the upshot is that Demetrius now offered Jonathan the high priest role and residence in Jerusalem, and all prisoners would be returned. And the request is that Jonathan and Judea would support Demetrius, their old nemesis, in the coming war. So Demetrius is looking for allies. Well, Jonathan responded favorably to Demetrius's offer, but then almost immediately after this, he received an offer of friendship from the opponent, Alexander Bayless. Well, ascertaining that Demetrius could not fulfill or probably would not fulfill all of his promises and was more than capable of reneging on the deal, Jonathan agreed to back Alexander Bayless. Well, Bayless and his allies moved on Demetrius in the year 150 BC, and he lost both his throne and his life as Alexander Bayless became the new king of the Seleucid Empire. Well, Bayless now married Cleopatra Tia, who was the daughter of one of his allies, Ptolemy VI and Cleopatra II. And this wedding took place in Ptolemais, and John, Jonathan was invited. Well, he was given a throne between Alexander Bayless and Ptolemy VI to signify his, important in, his importance in the changing political landscape. Well, this is quite an honor because Ju Judea hasn't even been seen as an independent country. It's been dominated by these warring factions. So now they give him a, a throne to sit on between them. Well, Alexander Bayless would not listen to the Hellenistic Jews, but they sent Jonathan back to Jerusalem with high honors. So it looks like the tide is turning in favor of the Jews. Well, the politics of this time were as changeable as the direction of the wind. So Demetrius II began making claims to the throne of the Seleucids against Alexander Bayless. Who's Demetrius II? He's another Seleucid that comes out of the woodwork trying to take over. And one of his generals moved against Jonathan and his brother Simon. Jonathan responded, and he won a great victory. And in the process, burned the city of Azo Azotus. And the people of Azotus claimed to complained to Ptolemy VI, who was now aligned against Alexander Bayless, but he met with Jonathan in friendship despite their support for rival claimants to the Seleucid throne. In 145 BC, at the Battle of Antioch, uh, this resulted in the overthrow of Alexander Bayless by the forces led by his father-in-law, Ptolemy VI, who was ironically killed in this battle, even though his army was victorious. Demetrius II was now the sole ruler of the Seleucids, but Jonathan owed him no homage, so Jonathan took advantage of this time to solidify his control over Judea. Demetrius came with an army to, Ta to Ptolemaeus, but he had no appetite for a war with Jonathan, so he called for a conference, and he gave him more control and more territory. Well, the Hellenistic Jews who backed the Seleucids were now infuriated by this. And then suddenly another new claimant to the throne of the Seleucids emerged, and this was the three-year-old son of the deceased Alexander Bayless. Well, of course, his claim was put forward by the self-serving man Diodotus Tryphon, and as Demetrius had not kept most of his promises to Jonathan, he thought it expedient to align with this new king and his regent. So Jonathan's getting himself in a lot of troubles trying to make alliances here. He also made new treaties with Rome. And then Tryphon reaffirmed all of the grants made to Jonathan and gave him more territory along the coast all the way to Egypt. And Simon was also granted titles and, and control of these areas. Simon was the last remaining um, Hasmonean son. But Tryphon was a treacherous man. He invited Jonathan to a conference, and then he killed the thousand men that Jonathan had brought with him for protection. He took Jonathan hostage, and then he asked for his sons as hostages. A ransom was requested. 
And Simon, the only uh, Hasmonean who was uh, free, not trusting Tryphon, paid the ransom as he did not want anyone to say that he had condemned his brother for want of ransom. But Tryphon did not keep his word. He took the ransom, and then he had Jonathan and his son slain. So Simon was left alone, and he was selected as the leader of the nation. And Simon decided to align himself with Demetrius II and against Tryphon, who he blocked from advancing on Demetrius. In exchange for this support, Judea was exempted from paying taxes to the Seleucids, and their empire was now in serious decline. So Simon was proclaimed prince of the Hebrew Hasmonean dynasty in 149 by a claim of the prince and the peoples of Judea. This is the first time they've acted as a unified group. And in 139 BC, the Roman Senate formally recognized the independence of Judea as a distinct and apart from the Seleucid Empire. So now the Judea has uh, better backing from Rome and more protection from Rome. But the times of treachery were not over. Simon with his sons Judah and Mattathias were assassinated by agents of Ptolemy VII, who came out of Egypt. Only one of Simon's sons escaped, and that was John Hyrcanus. In 134 BC, John Hyrcanus was declared high priest and ethnarch, something less than a king, but a national leader nonetheless. And, and combining the high priest and the king would have significant repercussions. That is not the orthodox position. So if we look at the Hasmonean dynasty, we see that Mattathias and his five sons have now all been killed, and only a son of Simon, John Hyrcanus, is left to rule the nation. So we'll now look at the, John, the, the, the reign of John Hyrcanus and his sons. Well, during the first year of his reign, John Hyrcanus faces a very stiff challenge. The Seleucid Empire, even though it's weakened, it comes back once again under the new king, Antiochus VII, and the Seleucids lay siege to Jerusalem. During the siege, Hyrcanus turns out the Hellenists, because they're, they're more in favor of the Seleucids, who are stuck in a no-man's land between the armies. And finally, terms are offered. Hyrcanus must tear down the walls of Jerusalem, raise an army to serve with the Seleucids in their war with Parthia, and to pay 3,000 talents in taxes. Hyrcanus, to survive, does all this and gets the funds by looting the tomb of David. This will have serious repercussions. Hyrcanus is in big trouble. He did not protect the rural areas from destruction by the Seleucids when they came back. He drafted soldiers to go off and fight the Parthians, who were of no consequence to the Jewish nation. He had angered the Hellenists when he expelled them from Jerusalem during the siege. He offended the religious leaders by desecrating the tomb of King David. But suddenly, world events turned in his favor. King Antiochus VII was killed in battle, and the Seleucid Empire went into serious decline. Hyrcanus took this time to expand the limits of Judea. He assembled a mercenary army because the Jews were decimated by all the warfare of the past decade. In other words, he had to hire soldiers. So many Jews had been killed in, in combat. And as he conquered parts of Samaria, Galilee, and lands east of Jordan, that is the land of the Ammonites, and Idumea, the land of the Edomites, he began forced conversions, forced conversions of the conquered people to the Jewish faith. This type of action had never been practiced by the Jews before. It shows just how influential, far-reaching the Hellenization of Judea had been. Well, Hyrcanus came under criticism of the Pharisees. Pharisees were the separated ones. The Pharisees had evolved from the religious group known as the Hasidim, and they were fundamentalists, and they followed the law very closely, especially with regard to dietary and outward observances. They believed in the resurrection. They were never a majority, but they were quite respected by the citizenry. Now, the Pharisees were contrasted with another group known as the Sadducees, who, while they were still faithful, were much more inclined to lean toward cooperation with the Hellenists. They did not believe in the resurrection, miracles, angels, or eternal life. Now, after the death of John Hyrcanus, 
one of his sons, Aristobulus I, marries Salome Alexandra. He only serves as king for one year. And Salome then marries Alexander Janius. And he serves from 103 to 76. And when he dies, Salome reigns as the queen by herself from 76 to 67. Salome supports and endorses the Pharisees. Her husband endorses the Sadducees. Lots of trouble ahead. Upon the death of her husband, Salome Alexandra had her son, Hyrcanus II, installed as the high priest. And upon Salome's death, Hyrcanus declared himself king as well. So her, son, her oldest son is the high priest. Now he says he's the king. Well, many Pharisees became disturbed at this course of event and wanted to begin to back Estabulus, the younger brother. But Hyrcanus II was king for only three months when he died, and Aristobulus began a rebellion. And since Judea was an ally of Rome at this time, I'm sorry, Hyrcanus did not die. He was just deposed. So when Judea was an ally of Rome at this time, each brother, Hyrcanus and Aristobulus, asked the empire for help for, for get, uh, help in getting rid of their brother. So in other words, they both appealed to Rome for military aid. And that brings the Romans to Judea. And Pompey, who is a military general from Rome, had been given a five-year commission to rid the Mediterranean Sea of pirates. And most of the pirates were in the eastern end. So he was set out to do that. He had five years to do it. He did it in three months. He was very effective. So with nothing else to do, he looked around and he thought, I think I'll go see what's happening in Judea. So he first he goes into Syria. Um, and while he's there, Hyrcanus II and Aristobulus II each ask him for help in subduing his brother. And because the brothers couldn't work together. And because of this, the nation will be lost to Roman domination in the year 63. Because Pompey comes into to, uh, Jerusalem to help, but just simply stays and takes over. So Pompey selects a man named Antipater, who is not a Jew, to be the procurator of Judea and all Jewish possessions. This is a devastating situation for the Jews. He then assigns his son Faisal to govern Judea and Idumea, and his son Herod to govern Samaria and Galilee. Well, upon the death of Antipater, the Jews decide to revolt, and they invite the Parthians to help them push out the Romans. Well, in this new war, Faisal's put to death, but Herod escapes. He first goes to Egypt, and then he goes to Rome. And when he presents himself in Rome, he presents himself as the victim of a revolt of insurgent Jews, but he convinces the Roman Senate, and Senate that he's capable of reconquering the lost territory and will govern it for Rome if only they'll support him. So they go along with it, and he's named King of the Jews, and he's sent back to Galilee and Judea to restore Roman rule. He's given funding and soldiers to accomplish this and the political support of the very powerful Marcus Antonius. Well, he completes this task in three years. And so Roman rule is established throughout uh, Samaria, Galilee, Judea, and Idumea by the year 37. And we now have the end of the Hasmonean dynasty. We had Salome Alexandra, the queen, married to Alexander Janus, and she had two sons, Hyrcanus II and Astrobulus II. These are the ones who argue, and in their argument, uh, lose the kingdom to the Romans. They invite the Romans in, and in 63 BC, the Romans walk in and take over. Well, then they bring in Antipater, who is the procurator. He's bringing in his son, Herod. And then we have uh, a second Salome Alexander, the daughter of Hyrcanus II, and Jonathan Alexander, the son of uh, Aristobulus II. And they have a daughter, Mariami. And she will be known as the last of the Hasmoneans, and she becomes the wife of Herod, king of the Jews. So Herod's married to Mariami, and she's the last of the Hasmonean princesses, and she has two sons with Herod. And then Herod has Mariami and both of these sons executed when he suspects them of treason. Herod is a thug. He's a really bad dude. 
He has multiple wives. He kills more sons and a mother-in-law, all because he suspects them of treason. When he killed Mariami, he was still in love with her. So he had her body put in a giant vat of amber oil so that he could gaze upon her in death. Caesar Augustus, the emperor of Rome at the time, was quoted as saying about Herod that it is better to be Herod's pig than his son. In other words, the Jews would a pig would be safe amongst the Jews, but Herod's son is not safe amongst Herod. And Herod is, of course, the king from Scripture that orders the massacre of the innocents in Bethlehem. The only good things that Herod ever did was that he built a, a port, Caesarea, uh, which Judea did not have, an amphitheater, an aqueduct to bring water there. He also restored the temple, and he built the Antonia Fortress. So he did those things, but he was also the king that the Magi went to when they saw the star. So they met with King Herod, and they discussed what they knew of the prediction of the future king. So in this end of the Hasmonean dynasty, we see that Jonathan inherited the leadership and he used diplomacy to, to achieve some objectives and create a national identity. And Simon achieves independence of Judea for a while and formal recognition by Rome and other nations. And then John Hyrcanus, to keep power, raids the tomb of David, which, which bothers a lot of people. And then he takes other measures that offends the Pharisees but he ultimately wins their support and independence from the Seleucids. But the feuding brothers, Hyrcanus II and Astrobulus II, they set the nation up for an easy takeover uh, by the Romans. And then Herod, an Idumean, not a Jew, becomes the king of the Jews. And that's our story. We'll, we'll follow up with part three next week. So let us pray. In the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thanks for listening. Peace be with you.